Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Gasparovic. I am an engineer at Google Research Europe in Zurich, working on infrastructure for machine intelligence. And today, I'm excited to give you an introduction to machine learning using TensorFlow. I'll start by introducing you to TensorFlow itself, and then show you some examples of how we've been using it at Google. And I'll share with you a few recent and upcoming developments, and then talk about how you can get started solving real problems with machine learning. So first, let's talk about exactly what it is that TensorFlow does and why you might want to use it. TensorFlow lets you get straight to work solving all kinds of machine learning tasks. The goal is that, in general, no matter what your problem looks like, TensorFlow should be able to support it at some level of the API. And in general, it's designed to be fast, so it's optimized for the hardware and the platforms that you actually want to use it with. One of the things that I think really makes it unique in terms of machine learning frameworks is that you can actually build a model in, let's say, you know, five or ten lines of code, and then take that model and scale it all the way up to production. So you can train that model on a cluster of you know, tens or even hundreds of machines, and then take that model and serve it doing super low latency predictions. Um, so let's have a little discussion about what it is that I mean when I say model specifically and uh, how machine learning relates to that. Here's a simple problem. Predict whether an image contains a cat or a dog. This is something that would be difficult or even impossible to do with traditional programming because, you know, how do you make a set of rules that define what is a cat versus a dog? And then on top of that, how do you capture all of the variations like breeds, poses, and then the brightness and the scaling of the image, all of that sort of thing? Um, so what we can do instead is make a neural network which is like an extremely simplified version of how neurons in the brain work. Each one of the dots in this image is a neuron, and they're all connected together layer by layer from the input of what we see to the output of what we understand. And then what we do is we go through lots and lots of examples of cat and dog images. They're all labeled with the correct category, and we try to make a prediction. Initially, all of those neurons are just randomly initialized, so it's a complete guess. Um, what we do is we calculate how far we are from the guess to the correct answer, the error, and then we use that error to adjust the strength of the connections between the neurons. And basically, we want to slowly move towards the right answer. After we repeat that, you know, a million or so times, let's say, then what you end up with is a nice cat and dog prediction model. But what you actually want to do is, you know, build a cat and dog prediction website, right? A user w gives you a photo, and you have to tell them whether there's a cat or a dog in it. And the connection strengths that you learned during training are what allows your model now to generalize. Um, so if you give it this photo, even though it's never seen it before and there's no label attached to it, it can get a dog prediction out based on what the model has learned via those weights attached to the neurons about you know, the nature of cats versus dogs, at least in terms of the images that it's seen. But how much it can actually learn is a function of the model size and the complexity. And um, we just didn't have computer power and the tools to experiment with really big and complicated models until very recently. This picture is basically what neuro neural networks used to look like maybe five or ten years ago. And at that point, they had a small number of neurons. They were just fully connected between the layers. Um, there weren't that many layers. And the end result was they weren't super powerful. Uh, in fact, for a problem like computer vision, they were almost written off compared to a specialized 
hand-tuned model that was built by experts for that exact task. Now you can compare that to a neural network model that we use today for image classification. This is called Inception. And the idea is that you feed it an image and you get a prediction of what's in the image among thousands of categories. I think it's like 17,000 potential classes. Uh, and with a framework like TensorFlow, you can train a model like this that has you know, tons of layers and is much more complicated than the early networks. That's what we mean when we say deep learning. The deep, in this case, refers to a deeper arrangement of layers and the more complicated connections that comes with that. The end result is that you have millions or even billions of neurons in your model. And that's what allows a deep neural network to get results that can actually vastly outperform the earlier uh, hand-built, hand-tuned models. But the specific reason why TensorFlow is so efficient at working with those huge networks is because it turns the code that you write into a graph of operations. And it's the graph that it actually runs. Uh, the data, by the way, that flows between those operations are called tensors, which is you know, where the name comes from. Um, and because your model is represented as a graph, you can do things like delaying or removing unnecessary operations or even reusing partial results. The other thing that you can do really easily is a process that's called backpropagation. So if you remember, when we updated the strength of connections in our model based on the examples that we saw and the error that we calculated, that's the process of backpropagation. Because the model is represented as a graph of operations instead of code, you don't have to write additional code for that. You can just compute and apply those updates automatically. Uh, and another nice side effect of having a graph around is that you can, in your code, say, using a one-line declaration, I want this part of the graph to run over here, I want this other part of the graph to be distributed to a different set of machines, or you could even say, I want this part of the graph that's very math intensive to run on a GPU while the you know, data input code runs back on the CPU. And TensorFlow runs on CPUs and GPUs out of the box. It also can load models and run inference tasks, like doing a prediction or a classification, on iOS and Android devices, and now even a Raspberry Pi device. And then inside of our data centers, we've been serving TensorFlow graphs using this specially built hardware that we call a Tensor Processing Unit, or TPU. So doing that backpropagation and then applying forward in the network the strengths of connections between the neurons for each layer, that is basically very large uh, matrix math operations. And that's something that TPUs do a lot of very quickly, very well. Um, version two of the TPU hardware, we're calling the Cloud TPU. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So once upon a time, um, Python was basically the only choice if you wanted to build a TensorFlow graph. And it's still a perfectly great choice. It's very simple. There's a lot of example code out there. It supports everything out of the box. But there's also support for a whole variety of other languages. Um, and since TensorFlow is open source, there are a lot more additional language choices with community support uh, that are being added all the time. And so the end result is that if you're interested, you can try out TensorFlow in probably your favorite language right now, and it'll work out of the box. And I just wanted to mention my coworkers on the TensorFlow serving team just announced uh, their 1.0 release last month, which is a really huge milestone for them. Because TensorFlow serving is a very, very high performance piece of infrastructure that you can use to load your models and then serve inference requests, low latency, 
uh, on your servers. Internally, we use it for about 800 products, but we really wanted to release it as part of the open source distribution because it's such an important aspect of you know, a real-world deployment. That's one of the things that when we say TensorFlow is production ready, it's things like this that make the difference between code that you write for doing research and being able to actually run it in production, solving real problems. Another one is a tool called TensorBoard. So this is one of the visualizers that's included in the package. Uh, this particular one is showing a clustering of handwritten digits that a model learned uh, for that particular task. In general, visualizing what's happening in a model and then trying to debug predictions that you get out of it is, uh, has traditionally been a very difficult aspect of machine learning. It's kind of, uh, you know, one of the um, Achilles heels, you know, of a, a lot of machine learning frameworks. And so just like with TensorFlow serving, that's something that we really wanted to include because that, you know, you wouldn't be able to serve something in production unless you were able to actually understand what's going on inside of the model and figure out if it made a prediction that doesn't match what you expected, why that's happening. And so that production readiness in general, I think, has really been one of the keys to the success of the framework and one of the things that makes it different. Um, TensorFlow, since its release, uh, has been the number one machine learning repository on GitHub. And it's really been incredible to see the adoption since it was released. Um, this chart shows the number of stars on GitHub since it was launched. And the last time I checked, it was, uh, I think, over like 68,000 at this point. Um, and I think one of the other reasons is because we actually take our place in the open source community really seriously. Um, it's never been for us a matter of, you know, throwing code over the wall or like taking a dump from our source code repository and just open sourcing that and that's the end of it. Open source and open source contributors have been a totally first class part of the process since it was released. At this point, we've had more than a thousand external contributors on TensorFlow, and some of those external commits have added huge new features like um, additional languages, as I mentioned earlier, um, additional hardware support, and even whole new platforms that TensorFlow runs on. And the other aspect of our, uh, of our open source work is making sure that users are productive and informed about how best to use TensorFlow. So to do that, we've answered thousands of questions on Stack Overflow. Um, and we are also very serious about looking into and fixing issues on our um, GitHub issues page. Because in general, we want to have a really seamless experience from the time that you download the framework to the time that you actually launch a model in production. But just to be clear, you know, we use TensorFlow a lot within Google. Um, this graph shows the number of directories in our source control tree with models in them um, over time. And the orange bar is when we internally released TensorFlow for uh, all projects to use. So you can see before that there was interest in machine learning, maybe there were some people whitelisted or using our precursor um, framework. And then after it was released, the, it just exploded. And um, there are more than 6,000 products at Google using TensorFlow today. And in fact, it's pretty much every major Google product is using TensorFlow and doing machine learning in some form or another. Um, and that has given us a ton of feedback and opportunities to make TensorFlow better by doing things like uh, streamlining the APIs that we provide adding new high-level APIs over time to make it uh, easier to use, and um, you know, also just providing some of the uh, production-ready tools that I mentioned. 
So let me show you some of the things that we've been specifically using TensorFlow for because there's so much variety in the types of problems. Uh, it's, I think, a good demonstration of how flexible it is as a framework. Google Translate used to use a model that basically translated word by word, maybe a few phrases here and there, but that was basically the extent of it. And then on top of that, it had hundreds of thousands of lines of hand-tuned code written with the input of linguists and language experts. Even so, it had a lot of difficulty accommodating all of the nuances and differences in human languages. And so here's an example on the right of translating a particular Chinese phrase into where will the restroom, which you know, leaves a lot of room for improvement. Um, we've replaced that entire previous system with a new deep neural network-based system called Neural Machine Translation, and that's running on TensorFlow. And the end result is that many of the language pairs have had huge gains in translation quality, up to 85% in some cases. And the reason why is because the model works by considering a whole sequence of words, a sequence input and a sequence output. And so the end result is that you get a more natural sounding output, um, much more like a human translator would do. For instance here, excuse me, where is the toilet? A much better result. And sticking with that translation theme, we added the word lens feature to the Translate app. Um, and this is actually running on a mobile device. It works in airplane mode, which is pretty incredible considering that it's doing, you know, basically a combination of computer vision and translation all in the same model. We had to add uh, features to TensorFlow specifically to make things like that possible. Um, and now you can train a model on a cluster of servers or one machine, however you would do it normally, but then take that model and reduce the size of it to fit on the device while keeping the quality high. And then Google Photos is an example of an already great product that was enhanced by adding a machine learning functionality to it. So in about six months' time, the team took that inception-based image classification system and got it working live in Google Photos. And the idea is that you can take a term and search for it in your photos for pretty much anything. Like you can type in beach and get photos of beaches, you can type in umbrella and get a photo that contains an umbrella in it, or even an abstract term like sunny and without previously having added those tags to your photos. A more difficult image-based task using another deep neural network is uh, the show and tell model from Google Research. It takes an image input and it outputs a human sounding caption. Um, it also starts with that inception model, but in this case, it's not just classifying the objects that appear in the image, it's actually writing a caption that sounds natural and captures the relationship between objects that appear in the image. To do that, the model was fine-tuned on examples of images that had human-generated captions. Uh, and from that, it learned about relationships. As a side effect of that process, the model actually got better at describing details in the images like colors, because it found that those are things that humans want to hear in a caption that they like. And so Google Research, by the way, open sourced the entire model there, and there's an in-depth post about it on the research blog, and you can go and there and follow the links and uh, try it out for yourself. One of the other things that we've been doing at Google Research is working on diagnosing a condition called diabetic retinopathy using computer vision. Um, ideally, you go to an ophthalmologist, they take an image like this, and they analyze it for early signs of diabetic retinopathy. Um, that's important because if you catch the disease early enough, it's easily treatable. The problem is in the developing world, there aren't enough ophthalmologists to go around, and so it's hard to catch it in time. 
the end result is that it's become the fastest cause of blindness in the world. So we published an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which shows that a computer vision model can actually be as good or even slightly better than the average ophthalmologist at diagnosing the condition. And so that's something that we're really excited about because if we can get the model out there, then it'll have a real impact to help find more of these cases before it's too late. And one last thing from the research team is um, this problem of using a deep neural network to actually learn what kind of architectures are good for solving different types of problems. So what we're able to do is do a search from a poor performing machine learning model to one that's much more accurate without any human intervention in between. The model actually builds a machine learning model that solves the task. And those sort of problems are called uh, learning to learn, which is a really exciting area in the field of research. And uh, there's going to be a lot more happening in the next couple of years uh, in, in that area. But just before you get the idea that you know, TensorFlow is meant for long-term research or it's meant for like big budget blockbuster apps, um, I wanted to show you a Japanese cucumber farmer. His son, in the back of the photo there, built an automatic cucumber sorter using TensorFlow, uh, along with an Arduino controller and a Raspberry Pi. He trained the model by showing it 7,000 examples of cucumbers in nine different categories. And so this is a job that his mom was doing for 10 hours at a time after every cucumber harvest. And, you know, in his words, he said, I want to leave sorting to AI so that we can focus more on growing good cucumbers. So after the model was trained, he hooked, it up, he, he hooked up a conveyor belt to the controller and an array of webcams to the Raspberry Pi. And so as each cucumber comes along the belt, it's imaged by the webcams, it's classified, and it's sorted automatically, um, which I think is just a fantastic example of uh, something really outside the box that you can do practically with uh, machine learning. And so uh, TensorFlow was, I think, really powerful for solving all of those sort of problems as of the 1.0 release. But there have been quite a few new developments since then. So let me just go over a couple of those with you now. Uh, first of all, it's gotten a lot easier to use. Um, so I mentioned TensorFlow has always been extremely flexible with the goal of being able to solve any sort of problem that you throw at it. But it wasn't always the easiest to use necessarily. Um, it, it, has the distributed execution engine at the bottom there, which is what actually executes the graph of operations and distributes them among the processors and machines. That is, has pretty much stayed the same. Um, as of 1.0, then we added a layers API with the idea that you could construct a model without having to actually mess around with the graph and operations directly. But you still had to build the actual network architecture and all of the layers and that sort of thing. You still had to do that part by hand. And then we added on top of that the Estimator API, which is a high-level way to take a model and combine that with inputs and uh, do the training and evaluation process. Um, now, as of 1.3, we added another layer on top of that for what we call the canned estimators. With a canned estimator, you can create a deep neural network classifier in literally one line of code. Um, and then when you use the high-level estimator APIs, you get a bunch of things for free, like distributed training, automatic snapshots, uh, and the ability to run on a mix of hardware that you have, like the CPUs and GPUs. You also get all of the best guarantees that the performance improvements that we've been making will actually apply to your model. Um, we've started publishing benchmarks of different tasks running on different combinations of hardware. And that is important because it's going to show how we're going to continue to 
improve performance over time. But it's also important because uh, it can tell you how you should expect TensorFlow to behave on the combination of you know, hardware that you have and a problem that you're trying to solve. And as far as uncommon configurations, uh, here's the cloud TPU uh, that I was talking about earlier. It's the second generation tensor processing unit. Um, the first generation we only used for accelerating the inference part of machine learning. The second generation also accelerates training. And it's a big improvement um, in general because each cloud TPU does 180 teraflops individually. But they're meant to be connected, 64 of them at a time, into these TPU pods. Um, one pod is 11.5 petaflops, which is just an enormous amount of operations. Um, and the neural translation model that I talked about earlier uh, used to take a full day to train on 32 of the best GPUs that we could get our hands on. And now we train it to the same accuracy in about half a day using one eighth of one of these TPU pods. And the cloud, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the cloud TPU, by the way, we're making available on the cloud platform to uh, external users later on in the year. And I'll have a little bit more information about that uh, at the end of the talk. We also need to make sure that we're fully taking advantage of whatever hardware you give to the machine learning task, whether it is a TPU or the GPUs that you have, or even just the instructions that your CPU supports. So we've been working on a compiler that converts those graphs that I talked about directly into assembly code. It's called XLA, uh, which is for Accelerated Linear Algebra. It's a requirement for running on the TPUs, but it also runs in JIT mode to compile a graph for CPUs and GPUs so that it can choose exactly the right kernels for the hardware that you have available. And then there's a third mode that's meant for mobile uh, where you can compile a model ahead of time and run predictions on the mobile device. The advantage is that the compiled model is much smaller, but it's still has the possibility of running more efficiently as well on the specific device. And one last note about mobile is we are working on TensorFlow Lite, which is a whole new runtime that's specifically built for Android mobile devices. The idea is that you put a very slim engine in a mobile app which supports exactly the hardware that you have on the device. And then it leaves out all of the unnecessary general purpose code. When you combine that with an XLA compiled model, you get the efficient use of hardware with a small memory footprint. And so you can do those on-device inference tasks like I showed earlier, as well as something new that we're calling federated learning, where you can take advantage of a model that's been trained um, and is you know, running in the cloud somewhere while having your own individual training data on the device. So it's never sent to the cloud, but you can combine those together on the device. Even if you have a lot of programming experience, uh, I will readily admit that getting into machine learning can be daunting, very daunting. Um, and one of the benefits of trying out TensorFlow is that the stuff that you play around with, you can eventually actually use in production. But still, I would like to give you some tips on uh, how you can get started, no matter what level you're at. First recommendation is to start at tensorflow.org, uh, because there's a getting started section there that has a nice hands-on introduction to TensorFlow, as well as some machine learning tasks that you would want to do with it. Um, and they assume some knowledge of Python for those particular intros, but that's about it. And then if you start with those, you can progress all the way through the tutorials to building things like a convolutional network, which is good for image classification tasks, and a recurrent network, which is good for those uh, language and translation tasks. And then there's also a really interesting demo of different neural network architectures and parameters at uh, playground.tensorflow.org. 
you can try varying the number of layers or the number of neurons or the features, the learning rate, and get an intuition about how neural networks work by seeing the effect on a very simple classification problem. And then once you start once you're ready to start building real models uh, to use in production, I recommend using that high-level estimator and canned estimator APIs because you get all of those uh, automatic benefits like the saved and restored checkpoints, exporting the tensor board, and the ability to do um, distributed training with pretty much no additional work. So nine times out of 10, or even more than that at this point, the Estimators and the canned estimators are the way to go. And then, of course, by using estimators, you could, if you wanted to, move your model onto cloud TPUs down the road pretty much automatically. Um, and at g.co slash TPU signup, there is a signup form if you're interested in finding out more information about those. That link is also the place to go to find out about the um, TensorFlow Research Cloud. So we're making 1,000 of those cloud TPUs available for free to machine learning researchers because there are so many people that have uh, great ideas but limited access to the kind of hardware to do the really state-of-the-art research. Um, so check out that link as well if you would like to apply for that. And finally, um, there are a number of good online courses for machine learning. Um, I recommend checking out the Google Developers YouTube channel. And also, Udacity has a course called Deep Learning, which uses TensorFlow, but really gets into the theoretical and math background of machine learning. And if you like that course and you want to continue with it, then it's a good step towards getting their machine learning nano degree. I really hope honestly, that you do want to continue with machine learning because it is an incredibly exciting field. It's more accessible than ever, and there is so much happening. Um, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.